Hi everyone and welcome to this week's World's End History Story. This week is another video in the series of Tales from the Past in World's End and the surrounding areas. As with all the other videos like this, they are mostly little glimpses into the past life of everyday people in World's End over the years. Some stories might be about more well-known people and some of the stories might be a little longer than the others. As always, they are from various years and in no particular order. In 1888, three ladies who were known by the names of Anne Senior, Anne Junior and Ellen were charged with having stolen four pence worth of coal at Wall's End. This was apparently not the first time that they had done this and on the first occasion they had been warned not to do it again. However, this time they were all fined one shilling and also made to pay for the coal. I always find stories like this terribly sad. Poverty was a huge thing in the 1800s and I often think that those stealing coal were probably just desperately looking for a way to keep their family warm. In 1933, a baby show was announced in the papers. It stated that the baby show will take place at Willington Key Maternity Hospital on July the 17th, and the prizes would include a silver mug for the best baby born in the hospital and a silver cup for the best twins born in the hospital. The winners would then apparently compete against the winners of a similar baby show at Corbridge Maternity Hospital. It sounds to me like some kind of bonny baby competition. Sadly, I never found any details of who the winners from Willington Key were or any of the details of the later competition. But I was wondering if anyone listening knows anything more about these kind of baby shows. In 1836, an article in the papers appeared discussing the merits of the teaching of the children in Wall's End by the Wall's End Church School which of course would be St. Peter's. It was stated that for the past three Sundays, the children had displayed their knowledge of scripture and religious subjects that would have done credit, so the paper said, to many an adult Christian. The paper was keen to suggest that the church school was teaching the children well and that they were delighted to learn. The vicar at the time was the Reverend Armstrong, who you may remember from another of these mixed stories of Wall's End, and he had played a huge part in getting the church school set up and built in Wall's End. In 1839, a very strange story appeared in the papers, also connected to St. Peter's. It was stated that a young sailor and a young woman, and neither of them are named, had gone to the church requesting to be married. The vicar had begun the service and on reaching the point where he asked the bridegroom to place the ring on the bride's finger, the young sailor attempted to place the ring on her little finger. The vicar said this was wrong and it should be placed on the third finger of the left hand. To this, the young sailor replied that he had never known the thumb to be classed as a finger before. The vicar at this point was said to refuse to continue with the marriage service and no amount of persuasion could make him change his mind and the couple had to leave the church only half married. Sadly, we will never know if they managed to get married elsewhere as without names they are impossible to find and I guess we will always have to wonder if he really didn't know his fingers from his thumbs. In 1887, a man who we will simply call Peter, who was 40 years old at the time, found himself before the magistrates at the Moot Hall in Newcastle on a charge of having broken into a hen house in Wall's End and stolen two chickens from a lady by the name of Maria Rodham. Peter pleaded guilty to the crime, and it maybe seems like quite a small crime in comparison to others. However, it seemed that Peter was quite a well-known thief in the Wall's End area, and since 1858, when he was just still a child, he had been in and out of prison many times, and his most recent stay had been a seven-year sentence in 1880, and he had ba barely been released before he was back to his old habits. Thanks to his past history of crime, he found the two stolen chickens would cost him five more years in prison. 
However, it doesn't seem to me that this would make much difference, as his previous days in prison had not made him change his ways. I did try to find out what happened to him after this, but sadly was not able to find any further trace of him. In 1889, the Primitive Methodist Chapel held their anniversary meeting in the Co-op Hall, no doubt because this would hold more people than the chapel itself. Preachers from Newcastle came especially for the service and the choir sang a selection of songs. A collection was held which raised £6, which today would be around £950, so it was quite a good amount of money. But it doesn't really compete with St Paul's in Wilton Quay, who had recently held a bazaar which raised £159, which today would be a massive £25,000. In 1888, a lady by the name of Mary was found to be sleeping on the streets of Wall's End without any visible means of supporting herself. She was taken to court for vagrancy and was sent to prison for 14 days. She was not too impressed at this and was said to reply to the sentence by saying, I've got 14 days for day and note. This is another sad example of the poverty that was around in the 1800s and the prison sentences that you could receive for sleeping on the streets. I have to admit that this story also reminded me of something my nana always used to say to me when I was a kid, about always making sure I had money with me when I was out, so that I could not be arrested for not having any means of support. In October of 1910, the newspapers reported details of the sad death of Dr. Edward Ernest Woodhouse of Willington Quay. Dr. Woodhouse had been born in Sunderland in 1870. His father was a vicar, the Reverend John Woodhouse, and the family would later move to Biker, where they would remain for many years. Dr. Woodhouse went to the Durham College of Medicine, where he completed his medical degree. He married Mary Younger in 1896, and the couple had eight children together, though sadly four had died by 1910. The family would later move to Willington Quay and in 1901 they could be found living in Western Road. Dr Woodhouse set up his practice there and he was quickly very much in demand, often seen heading off on his bicycle to see his next patient. The newspaper article stated that Dr Woodhouse was very popular. It was said that he had an infectious happy nature that made most of those of the area feel so much better just for knowing him and talking to him. In fact, the article went as far as to say that he was quite possibly the most popular man in Willington Quay at the time. He was also a keen golfer and was a member of the Wall's End Golf Club, though the paper seemed to wonder how he found the time to play as he was such a busy man with his practice. When he had first been taken ill, people had been calling at his house practically day and night to ask how he was, all wishing him a speedy recovery. And I'm sure it must have been nice for him to know how popular and well-liked he was, but I also suspect it must have been hard to rest and relax with such a steady stream of well-wishers calling at his home. But, sadly, his recovery was not to be. What had started as a chill a week or so before his death developed into pneumonia and despite being cared for by five doctors, two nurses and his devoted wife, nothing could be done to save him and Wilton Key went into mourning at his death with flags being flown at half-mast at Wall's End Slipway, the Tyne Iron Shipbuilding Company and at the Wall's End Golf Course. The funeral took place at Wall's End Cemetery, which we now know better as Church Bank Cemetery. It was said to be one of the largest funerals ever seen in the area. Although there is no estimated number of people who attended, the newspaper article states that thousands of people lined the route from the doctor's house to the cemetery and that all the businesses in the area were closed and curtains were drawn in all of the houses. The coffin, which was described as being made of solid oak, was carried by Inspector Cully and five other local police sergeants. There was an absolutely huge list of local people who had attended the funeral, but I won't include it here as it would take about 10 minutes just to read all of the names, 
but some I reckon recognise would be Dr Aitchison, Robert Irwin Dees and Dr Wilson of Wall's End. A service was held in St Peter's Church conducted by the Reverend Kemp, the Reverend Duppy and the Reverend Osborne. The same were in attendance at the graveside where the Reverend Kemp gave thanks on behalf of Mrs Woodhouse for the kindness shown to her and her family since her husband's death. And it was stated that the floral tributes took up two carriages at the funeral and they covered the entire area of the grave. The photos you have seen on screen for the last part of this story show the final rest and pace of Dr Woodhouse in Churchbank Cemetery. I remember finding his grave many years ago and often wondered who he was, so it was nice to find this story covering a little more information about his life. And Dr Woodhouse was only 40 years old when he died. It would seem that his wife had stayed in Wilton Key for a short while after his death as she is still in the area in 1911. She then emigrated to Australia where she died in 1955 at the age of 85 and it does not appear that she ever remarried. I hope that you have found these short little stories interesting and I do thank you all very much for watching and I do hope to see you all again very soon.